for the 18th annual Luther W. Stallnicker Lecture. Uh, the Stallnicker Lecture was conceived during 1984-85 academic year by Dean Mike Marty. And normally I've been able to introduce uh, Dean Marty here. I think now that he is retired. This will be the first year that uh, he's not uh, here for the lecture, but he did some reason for his regret um, to not be able to be here. He's living in Illinois. Um, Mike was wanting to create a meaningful and loveful event on campus and began to turn to the uh, professors of Maritai at that time to um, find support and a way to create the uh, event that he had envisioned. And he requested that they consider making special gifts that would underwrite a lectureship and would become the, you know, the important intellectual uh, event uh, which he had foreseen. He worked at first with uh, Ellsworth Woods, who was the Dean Emeritus, um, and a number of other faculty. And those faculty have continued to provide tremendous support uh, in uh, continuing to uh, work on this event, support it financially, and to support it intellectually. Um, Professor Emeritus of Religion, John McCall, who is here with us this evening, has contributed much time in our John, would you stand for a minute? Uh, and John has been very instrumental in ensuring the continued uh, success of this event and works hard on it and writes letters and uh, does a variety of tasks that are very important to the event. Um, also important to the event, and people I would like to recognize, are the other faculty of Maritai uh, who continue to support and sponsor this event. Um, other faculty of Maritai who are present, please stand, be recognized. It's wonderful to see 
to hear. This is one of the more exciting and enjoyable intellectual events of our academic year. Uh, as Sue noted, it's uh, one of our more important intellectual traditions uh, and it's become one of the genuine high points of, of the school year at Drake. It's a special occasion that gives us the opportunities we just did to, to remember the contributions and the, and the, the uh, accomplishments of Luther Stonemaker who served this university with such distinction. And it's also an occasion, as we just get to give thanks to our emeriti faculty members uh, for their continuing support of this lecture. It's also an opportunity for us to honor one of our own, uh, one of our own faculty whose uh, excellence in teaching and scholarship exemplify the spirit and the character of Drake. The lectures have come to symbolize Drake's continuing role as a center of intellectual vitality uh, as much as any other series of events or celebrations that we have. And as I'm sure many of you know, we've worked very hard over the last several years to make Drake University the place where the community comes together, comes together to talk, to discuss important issues, to raise important concerns, to share insights, knowledge, perspectives, and experiences. And the Stallnecker Lecture has been, uh, in many ways, and for many years, the cornerstone of this effort, the coming together of the community to share, to share what we know, what we think, and what we believe. Again, my welcome to all of you, and it's now my pleasure to introduce last year's Stellmaker Lecture, Ellison Mel Levin, Professor of Sociology, Dean Wright. Thank you. There are two perks that go with being a Stallnecker Lecturer. One is being a member of the committee that selects subsequent Stallnecker Lecturers. And number two is having the opportunity to introduce the one immediately following yourself. So tonight I have the pleasure and distinction to introduce the 18th annual Stallnecker Lecturer, David G. Skidmore II. David joined the university faculty in 1989 as an assistant professor and has risen through the ranks to the level of professor of politics and international studies. Those who know David recognize, as has Drake University, his expertise as a teacher, scholar, and a person skilled in community service to Drake University and mentorship to his students. On his travels to Drake, David received his BA at Rollins College, his MA and PhD at Stanford University, and then was an instructor at Hamilton College and Notre Dame. Professor Skidmore is the author of four books, his most recent being an edited work published in 1997 titled Contested Social Order and International Politics. He has published a number of refereed articles, book chapters, and refereed case studies and simulated games, plus a number of other writings in a variety of academic and non-academic locations. As a final scholarly note, David has presented over 20 papers at professional meetings. Professor Skidmore is the recipient of several awards, including grants from the Arthur Binding Davis Fund, the Drake Center for Humanities, the Faculty Research Grant, faculty development grants. Add to these honors his peers had given him when they invited him to review books plus faculty development workshops and you begin to see why we invited David to present the 2002 Stallnaker Lecture. One cannot introduce David without noting his many service activities at Drake. The list is much too long to detail but I would be remiss unless I noted that he is the director of the newly created Center for Global Citizenship, director of the Drake Curriculum, coordinator of the first year seminar programs, principal designer of Pathways to Knowledge program, and has served as an associate dean in the College of Arts and Science for Curriculum Development. Tonight, Professor Skidmore presents the 18th annual Luther W. Stockton Stallnecker Lecture titled Global Vision, Bugyama's Dream, Huntington's Nightmare, and Grassroots River. And now to explain to us what all of those images means is Professor David G. Skidmore II. Let us give him a warm welcome. David. So I'm going to say a few words 
and without amplification. And then I'm going to pause before I begin my formal remarks and ask you if it's okay without mic or if you prefer that I will take a little vote, okay? Um, first thing I want to say is to uh, uh, thank you, Mike, right, for your, your kind words and I uh, appreciate that very much. And also to say, of course, what an enormous privilege it is uh, to have the opportunity to speak before you tonight. Uh, and, and what a responsibility. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that, uh, that Charlene could be here tonight. And my two daughters, who uh, finally get to see what their dad uh, occasionally does. So uh, they're probably going to be my toughest critics here this evening. But I'm very happy to have them here. Um, well, before I, I start then, let me ask, uh, should I turn on the mic or not? No. No? Okay. Well, let me begin. With the first anniversary of 9-11 still fresh in our minds, and talk of war in the air, Americans are more attentive to international affairs than at any point in recent memory. We understand now that our country is not an island. We are intimately connected to others in a troubled world. The stakes are too high for us to shrink from considering the roles that each of us must play in constructing a more just and peaceful world. This rethinking requires that we step back from recent events and wrestle with broader questions about the underlying forces that shape the I would like to begin this task tonight by asking you to consider a very different moment in recent history, namely December 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Recall, if you are old enough, the images of jubilant Berliners from the east and west dancing and singing atop the wall, taking turns swinging sledgehammers at that hated symbol of the Cold War. Remember the sense of relief and optimism that Americans felt in contemplating the end of a half century of superpower confrontation. Now try to imagine my panic in witnessing the same scene. There I was, a newly minted PhD, only a few months into my first tenure track position here at Drake. Watching as those cheeky East Germans rendered obsolete much of what I knew about international affairs. I shuddered as I focused on my upcoming classes and contemplated the frightening question, so what am I going to teach now? I wasn't alone, of course, in finding the end of the Cold War disorienting. For more than a decade now, Various thinkers have been trying to define the nature of the emerging post-Cold War international order. What is its structure? What are the characteristic lines of conflict and cooperation? What are the driving forces of change? A great debate has ensued, much of it focusing on the phenomenon of globalization. What is clear is that the growing political, economic, and cultural integration of the world has touched off a struggle among varied actors, including states, global corporations, terrorists, international drug cartels, and transnational social movements, over who gets to define the terms of a new global order. More difficult to foresee is where the struggle will lead, toward a world of peace, justice, and cooperation, or one of violence, inequity, and conflict. In my remarks today, I would like to discuss and critique three positions in the current debate. Liberal universalism, cultural dystopianism, and grassroots globalism. Each represents both a vision of the future and a blueprint for action. Each perspective is rooted in a long-standing tradition of thought and action and each will be analyzed here today with respect to a particular text. Allow me to briefly survey the three perspectives before coming back to offer some comments on each. Perhaps the best known representation of the liberal universalist vision is Francis Fukuyama's 
widely discussed as a The End of History, which appeared in 1989 and was later expanded into a book. Although the fall of the Berlin Wall was still months away, Fukuyama anticipated the end of the Cold War and sought to understand its meaning. For guidance, he looked to the 18th and 19th century German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Hegel believed that history was driven by the class of ideas. The search for a social order structured around the principles of pure reason provided a deeper meaning to the disordered jumble of daily events. For Fukuyama, the end of the Cold War represented the final destination in that search for universal reason. The victor in the Cold War was not the United States, but the ideals represented by liberal democratic capitalism. In Fukuyama's own words, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War, but the end of history as such, that is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. As a blueprint for social order, liberalism rests upon two pillars, democracy in the political sphere and market capitalism in the economic sphere. Democracies offer the benefits of popular sovereignty individual rights, rule of law, and representative government. Markets offer the most efficient mechanism for allocating resources toward human wants. Note, by the way, that these commitments encompass much of the spectrum of mainstream politics in the United States. Despite their differences, both George W. Bush and Al Gore are heirs to a common political tradition that dates back to Adam Smith and John Locke. So when I use the term liberal today, I have this broader meaning in mind, in contrast with the narrower sense in which the term is typically used in American political discourse. Fukuyama argued that the combination of democracy and market capitalism had, over the course of two centuries, proved superior to and overcome a series of competing social orders. Feudalism, fascism, and communism had each in turn been vanquished by liberalism and its defenders. With the end of the Cold War, there remained no competing ideology of universal scope to challenge the hegemony of liberalism. Although the everyday flow of human events would continue, history with a capital H as the human search for the most ideal social order had reached an end. The consequences of this development of international relations Following earlier thinkers such as Immanuel Kant, Norman Angel, and Woodrow Wilson, Fukuyama argued that liberalism offered a solution to the age-old problem of war. In a liberal world, commerce replaces conquest as the surest route to prosperity. <coughs> Sharing common norms and institutions, liberal democracies resolve conflicts through diplomacy, a growing body of international law, and the establishment of multilateral institutions. Fear and rivalry give way to trust and cooperation. A liberal world would be a peaceful world. This then is Fukuyama's dream, the universal victory of a rational liberal social world. In the wake of 9-11, Fukuyama's assumptions about the universal appeal of liberal ideas might now appear more like wishful thinking than really. In fact, the pundits sought to make sense of the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. Many turned to another thinker whose perspective on the post-Cold War order serves as a polar opposite to that of Fukuyama. In 1993, political scientist Samuel Huntington published an essay titled The Clash of Civilizations. This rather terrifying label aptly characterized the pessimistic prophecies that Huntington offered within his article and subsequent book. Yet the phrase itself was brought from historian Bernard Lewis, who wrote of a coming class of civilizations in his essay, The Roots of Muslim Rage, that appeared in 1990. Both Huntington and Lewis hark back to an older tradition, a 
associated with thinkers such as Oswald Spengler and Arnold Toynbee, who each viewed history through the prism of the rise and decline of competing civilizations. Huntington's dystopian vision posits that the principal political cleavages of the post-Cold War world will center along the fault lines dividing civilizations from one another. Although states will remain the central actors in world politics, the alliance behavior of states will be largely dictated by civilization politics. Similarities and differences in core cultural values will serve as the main litmus test for distinguishing friend from foe. Unity among countries sharing the same overarching cultural values and commitments will rise, while conflict across civilization boundaries will grow. Fault line wars along the borders where civilizations come into contact will threaten to expand through what Cunnington calls kin country rally. While the clash of civilizations will be multifaceted, the most important dividing line will separate Western societies from the competing civilizations that Huntington identifies. Western cultural penetration and political domination has prompted both resentment and heightened attachment to non-Western cultures in other parts of the world. At the same time, the declining world of economic and demographic power of the West will bring growing political challenges the Western hegemony on the part of rising states representing rival civilizations. The result will be heightened civilization consciousness among non-Western societies. The continued pursuit of technological and economic modernization will be accompanied by efforts to resist cultural Westernization and to restore traditional values. So Huntington's thesis can best be characterized as the West against the rest. Most significantly, Huntington predicts a future anti-Western alliance uniting the growing power of China with the rising fundamentalism of the Islamic world. Huntington rejects the idea that globalization will lead to cultural convergence and holds out little hope that cultural conflict can be dampened through multiculturalism or other forms of other efforts to foster mutual understanding. The best hope for peace is the possibility that a stable balance of power among the major civilization blocks might deter aggression. For this to happen, however, the states and peoples of the Western world must recognize and unite together against the external dangers that they face. Thus, Huntington offers us a stark nightmare, a violent world seeding cultural conflict and hatred. Our third global vision, which I label grassroots globalism, rests upon a distinction between globalization from above and globalization from below. According to this view, globalization has thus far been a top-down process, managed by corporate elites and their political allies. The results have been predictable. Proliferation of third world sweatshops, corporate pillaging of the environment, the growing international indebtedness of poor states, the weakening of social safety nets, and the creation of increasingly powerful global regulatory institutions that serve the interests of capital without democratic oversight. The antidote from a grassroots globalist perspective is globalization from below. This project involves forging ties of transnational solidarity among citizens of different countries to serve as a counterweight to the power of corporations and states. The ultimate objective is the creation of a global civil society based upon voluntary transnational networks of individuals and groups seeking to realize common values and interests. The best discussion of this vision can be found in a book by Margaret Keck and Catherine Sicking titled Activists Beyond Borders. Catherine Sicking traced the historical development of transnational social movements back to their origins in the 19th and early 20th centuries. When, when causes such as opposition to slavery, the struggle for women's voting rights, and the campaign to end foot binding in China brought together reformers from different countries. 
More recently, the social and cultural changes of the 1960s served the lives of contemporary peace, environmental, human rights, women's, and indigenous people's movements. Over the past two decades, lower barriers to communication and travel have allowed these nationally-based social movements to link up with one another, while globalization and the increasing significance of international institutions have provided the necessary incentives to do so. Now, grassroots globalists seek not to reverse globalization, but to redirect it along lines that are more democratic, more inclusive, and that serve a broader range of interests. So grassroots globalism offers a vision of bottom-up, multicultural populism. Now, which of these global visions holds the most descriptive and explanatory power as we try to understand the present and <coughs> future evolution of the international system? Well, Fukuyama's liberal dream certainly seems plausible. Few Americans would contest the advantages of liberal democratic capitalism over fascism and communism. Globalization has been driven by the rush of countries everywhere over the past two decades to privatize state owned industries, deregulate their economies, and remove barriers to trade and investment. The truly global marketplace now appears within reach. The recent wave of democratization has spread across Latin America, the former Soviet bloc, and parts of Africa and Asia from a handful of countries 50 years ago. More than 60% of the world's people now enjoy democratic government, the highest proportion in history. Research into the so-called democratic peace thesis has confirmed that democracies rarely go to war with other democracies. Scholars have also found support for the claim that higher levels of economic interdependence are associated with lower incidence of war, war between nations. And yet, from our vantage point, a decade after Fukuyama's book appeared, it is difficult to sustain his optimistic perspective on liberal universalism or his estimate of its staying power. <coughs> Critics have pointed to many shortcomings of the liberal worldview, including the wretched environmental consequences of the liberal faith and unlimited economic growth, and the threat that commercialism and westernization poses to cultural diversity. But perhaps the most damning, however, is evidence that the globalization of market capitalism is producing growing economic inequalities within and among nations while concentrating political power in the hands of those who control a small group of global corporations. This reality, I argue, threatens to produce rising social instability while corrupting democratic processes of government. In response, new forms of resistance to globalization and its inequitable consequences have arisen, as evidenced by the street protests first witnessed at the 1999 World Trade Organization meetings in Seattle, and since then at virtually every major global meeting of political and economic leaders. This populist backlash against globalization and its consequences is already forcing a rethinking of liberal values and assumptions. <clears throat> the national and global concentration of wealth and power began really in the 1970s, Figures for the United States illustrate a pattern that is beginning to emerge in other developed countries. In his book, Wealth and Democracy, writer Kevin Phillips cites the following data, which I find truly striking. From the mid-1970s to the mid-1990s, the top 1% of income earners in the U.S. captured 70% of all income growth. Real income rose 72% within this small group while falling for the bottom 60% of the income distribution. If we examine overall net worth rather than income, an even more startling picture emerges. Between 1982 and 1999, the net worth of the 400 wealthiest Americans grew by 500%. The same figure for the top 1% of wealth holders was 75% real growth while the net worth of those located in the middle of the distribution fell by 10% during this period. 
As a result, they shift the share of household wealth belonging to the top 1% doubled from 20% in 1976 to 40% in 1997. In 1968, the ratio of average corporate uh, executive officer total compensation to the average annual pay of hourly production workers was 25 to 1. By 1999, that gap had risen to 419. A similar pattern is evident at the global level. The gap between the rich countries of the North and the developing world has grown over the past two decades. The major exceptions are in Asia, where China and a handful of other countries have experienced rapid growth rates. Even here, however, the catch-up effects are mitigated by the fact that Internal inequality has grown rapidly in China during the same period, while the 1997 Asian financial crisis and its after effects have stolen back some of the earlier gains made by a number of Asian developing countries. Over a longer period, the growing gap between rich and poor countries is captured in the fact that in 1870, average uh, income per capita in the 17 wealthiest countries was 2.4 times that of the combined average for all remaining countries. By 1990, the gap has grown to 4.5 to 1. In absolute terms, the global gap in income, wealth, and standards of living is alarming. The average income in the top 5% of income earners in the world is 114 times that of the average for the bottom 5%. High income countries account for 20% of the world's population, but also account for 86% of world income, 82% of exports. 68% of direct foreign investment. Among 4.4 billion people in the developing world, 3.5 billion live in communities lacking basic sanitation. One third lack access to safe drinking water. One fourth lack adequate housing, and one fifth are undernourished. In the past 15 years, <clears throat> per capita income has declined, declined in more than 100 countries. <laughs> And individual consumption has dropped by about 1% annually in more than 60 countries. Why has inequality increased so much in recent years, and what are the possible consequences? <coughs> to answer these questions, we really have to examine how globalization has historically altered the balance of power amongst various social forces in the global economy. Ours is not the first period of globalization. Free market liberalism of the late 19th century produced levels of international economic integration rivaling those of today. Yet the laissez-faire policies of that period were accompanied by growing inequality, imperialism, the concentration of industry, and intense class conflict. This first liberal order proved unsustainable and ultimately collapsed, ushering in a half century of war, revolution, nationalism, and economic integration. The second liberal international order emerged from the ashes of World War II. Its architects, mainly American, sought to avoid the mistakes of the 19th century. The great social theorist Paul Polanyi attributed the collapse of the first liberal order to, quote, the conflict between the market and the elementary requirements of organized social life. Liberals of the post-World War II era had no intention, of course, of abandoning the market or a more international economic exchange. They did, however, seek to circumscribe the social space in which markets, both domestic and international, operated, and to embed the market in a social compact among the state, capital, and labor. Capitalism had to be tamed in order to render it compatible with social peace and international Domestically, the post-war order was built upon social democracy, which entailed Keynesian macroeconomic management, the creation of uh, the welfare state, progressive taxation, public ownership of key industries, regulation of big business, and recognition of labor unions and collective bargaining. Internationally, a commitment to multilateralism and the gradual lowering of trade barriers was coupled with mechanisms designed to ensure against the transmission of negative economic shocks from one nation to another. These arrangements 
created the basis for a substantial degree of class peace, social stability, economic growth, and the consolidation of liberal democracy in the advanced industrial class world. Quite an achievement. This post-war order depended, however, upon the maintenance of a, some degree of national economic autonomy, particularly in terms of financial flows. The economist John Maynard Keynes argued that social democracy was compatible with free trade, but not with the uncontrolled flow of capital across the national borders, which undermined state control of our country's macroeconomic, macroeconomic fundamentals. Yet large corporations and banks chafed at the restrictions on their freedom to invest abroad. And when the e economic troubles of the 1970s hit, business argued that it was time to unleash capital from the confines of the national market and loosen the regulatory group of states. With the elections of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in, in the early 1980s, the era of social democracy essentially came to a close. What some have called the new neoliberal order has taken its place. And under neoliberalism, the role of the state has shrunk and national economic autonomy has given way to globalization. The political effect of this development has been to disrupt the social pact that lay at the core of the social democratic order. The balance among state, labor, and capital has shifted decidedly in favor of the latter. With capital controls and other sorts of restrictions lifted, capital has become internationally mobile to a greater degree than ever before. The same is not true of labor, whose movement across national borders remains heavily regulated, or of states, which remain territorial entities. The unilateral capacity of capital exit the national economy produces an asymmetry. As capital is a key ingredient of economic growth, business can pit workers and states in different countries against one another in a bidding war for investment. As a result, labor movements everywhere have lost clout, and the ability of states to regulate capital in the public interest has been compromised. In the United States, for instance, organized labor today represents only about 14% of the labor force as compared with 35% in the mid-1950s. One recent study found that 62% of labor organizing drives prompted threats by business owners to relocate production to low-wage countries. The threat of exit has also allowed corporations to win concessions from governments. Across the industrialized world, average tax rates on capital declined from 42% to 33% between 1986 and 1995 while taxes on the income of middle-class workers grew dramatically. It's not surprising, then, that the current era of neoliberal globalization has seen the returns to capital rise and those to labor decline, producing unprecedented levels of inequality both within particular nations and globally. Between 1987 and 1995, for instance, average productivity in the American economy grew by 15%, Yet, during the same period, pre-tax corporate profits grew 80%, while hourly wages in private industry grew by only 3%. Increased inequality might be tolerable if it were accompanied by increased rates of overall economic growth. In fact, however, economic growth rates have been lower over the past two decades than in the preceding two decades almost everywhere. Financial liberalization has also produced greater economic instability, particularly in developing countries, where repeated financial crises have rocked the economies of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Now, the spread of democracy over the past two decades has been a welcome development, but some have described these new political regimes as low-intensity democracies. In Latin America, for instance, not only have neoliberal reforms enfeebled the state, but perpetual debt problems have forced states to place themselves under the effective control of the International Monetary Fund. Crucial economic decisions are dictated not by the preferences of electoral majorities at home, but by technocratic, technocratic elites at international agencies such as the IMF and the WTO. 
which are, according to Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, using his words, closely aligned with the commercial and financial interests of those in the advanced industrial countries, and whose policies benefit the few at the expense of the many, the well-off at the expense of the poor. Indeed, the growing power of such international economic institutions reflects in no small degree a desire to create new global rules that will safeguard the interests of capital as it ventures beyond the relatively safe confines of home markets in the industrialized world. If these trends continue, it doesn't take a crystal ball to foresee the terrific social and political backlash that will bring an end to the end of history. Unless brought under the control of democratic forces, today's neoliberal international order may prove no more sustainable than its 19th century predecessor, transforming Fukuyama's dream into a nightmare. Or is the nightmare already here in the form of Huntington's class of civilizations? Any assessment of Huntington's thesis must ultimately turn on the question of whether globalization produces convergence or divergence across various cultures and civilizations. Huntington, of course, argues that globalization accentuates conflict by bringing people of fundamentally different values into frequent contact with one another. Moreover, he argues that non-Western civilizations view globalization as a Western scheme to control their economies and marginalize their traditional religious and cultural ideas. These conclusions rest upon two crucial assumptions. One, that members of each civilization respond to globalization in a uniform way. And two, that the dominant response to new cultural practices and ideas is rejection. Neither of these claims can withstand scrutiny. Each major religious or cultural tradition has historically included some elements that tend toward pluralism, inclusiveness, tolerance, and openness to the broader world, and other elements that tend toward orthodoxy, insularity, intolerance, and closure to outsiders. And in each case, both the balance and the intensity of conflict between these tendencies has varied over time. In general, the tendency toward insularity is strongest when a society faces external threat. And the tendency toward openness is greatest when cooperation with others offers rewards and opportunities. The central reality of globalization is that it presents a threat to some and an opportunity to others. Within each civilization, there are those who possess the right skills and assets to gain globalization and others who will be further marginalized. The most important effect of globalization, therefore, is not to pit united civilizations against one another, but to deepen divisions within each civilization between those who favor openness and cultural pluralism and those who favor solidarity and cultural uniformity. It is from among the latter, those marginalized by globalization, that we find the raw material for the rise of fundamentalist religious and cultural movements, whether Christian, Jewish, Islamic, or Hindu. While well, Huntington is correct then to note a rise in cultural conflict, he errs in portraying the primary cleavage as dividing one civilization from another. In, instead, the crucial clashes are occurring within civilization clusters, between those who are open to cultural exchange and the cooperation of those who are here. This is evident, for instance, if we examine the Islamic world, which is portrayed by Huntington and others as united in its hostility to the West. Islam as a religion is not inherently insular or xenophobic. The Holy Quran teaches Muslims that, quote, we created you from a single pair of male and female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know each other not that you may despise each other. Huntington offers the Bosnian War as a prototype of the class of civilizations. Yet it's worth noting that among the three combatants in this conflict, it was the Bosnian Muslim government that most clearly defended the values of tolerance, and democracy, and ethnic and religious pluralism. 
As an example of Kent Country Rally, Huntington cites to Don Hussein's appeal to Islamic solidarity against Western imperialism on the eve of the 1991 Persian Gulf War. Yet Huntington neglects to mention that this central bit of propaganda failed miserably, and that the majority of Arab states, as well as countries representing each of the major civilizations, supported coalition efforts <coughs> to reverse the Iraqi aggression against Kuwait. <coughs> While Osama bin Laden and the Taliban claimed to speak on behalf of the entire Islamic world in their denunciations and attacks upon the West, Less noted is the fact that a majority of Afghanis welcomed the overthrow of the Taliban and the ousting of al-Qaeda from their country. Now it's true, of course, that anti-Americanism runs strong on the streets of the Arab world. Yet surveys in the Arab countries show that majorities reject the notion that Islam and the West are engaged in a clash of civilizations. <clears throat> Consider, for instance, and I'm going to turn on my mic here because my, my voice is starting to fail. So, <clears throat> Consider, for instance, a recent survey. <clears throat> 5,000 young people aged 15 to 25 in nine Muslim Arab countries who were asked the name, the country you think most highly of. The most frequent, frequent response by far was the United States. Another survey of Muslims in nine Middle East nations found that large majorities had favorable views toward American culture, but seven out of ten disapproved of American policies toward Arab countries. Whatever Osama bin Laden's own motivations, anger toward the United States among average people in the Arab world stems from what we do, not who we are. None of this is to deny that the fact that there exist minorities in the Islamic world who seek to impose a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam on their fellow citizens and to use violence to combat unwanted external political, economic, cultural influence. Under conditions of economic stagnation, extreme of inequality, and repressive political regimes, it's perhaps not surprising that such movements would arise. Less noted in the West is that there all also exists in that part of the world popular movements that are pushing for greater democracy and openness, as for example in Iran. Unfortunately, these movements have received little support from the United States government, which has overlooked the undemocratic character of many of its allies in the region as long as they pursue pro American policies. In some, the processes of globalization and modernization are creating intense and conflicting pressures within the Islamic societies of the Middle East. This complexity defies the simplest and clash of the civilization thesis offered by them. In answer to the question of whether globalization produces cultural convergence or divergence across civilizations, we must say that both phenomena are occurring simultaneously. Each civilization contains elements that are open to cultural exchange with others, as well as those that seek to preserve cultural purity. Globalization intensifies the internal conflict within each civilization between these two sets of forces. If cultural fundamentalism represents one form of response to neoliberal globalization, then grassroots globalism represents another. The principal agents of this vision are non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, such as Amnesty International or Greenpeace. The growth of transnational NGOs over the past two decades has been impressive. From 1,000 in 1980 to 5,500 in 1996. So too is their impact on international politics. Transnational advocacy networks have played a major role and laying the groundwork for a number of important international agreements, including the Kyoto Global Warming Treaty, the International Criminal Court, the Landmine Ban Treaty, and the recent Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative for four countries. <clears throat> NGOs have also pushed, with some success, 
for international aid organizations and global corporations to adopt reforms designed to address the problems of poverty, workers' rights, and the environment. <coughs> Joseph Stiglitz, I mentioned him earlier, who, by the way, was a former, not just a Nobel Prize winner, but he's also a former World Bank economist. Uh, he has argued that, quote, it is the trade unionists, students, environmentalists, ordinary citizens, marching in the streets of Prague, Seattle, Washington, and Genoa, who have put the need for reform on the agenda of the developed world. NGO campaigns are typically organized through decentralized cooperation among hundreds of in independent groups. The non-hierarchical structure of transnational advocacy networks is both a strength and a weakness. On the one hand, its first networks possess enormous surge, enormous surge capacity. Over the short to medium term, NGO networks can mobilize considerable information, expertise, money, labor, once a shared objective has been identified. These networks are flexible, resilient, and efficient. On the other hand, the shifting coalitions of NGO politics do not allow for the accumulation of long-term power and institutionalized form. Once an immediate objective, such as passage of a, of, a, of a treaty, have been realized, coalitions typically disband or reform in different configurations around new goals. Groups often differ over ideology, goals, tactics, and of course they compete with one another for money, volunteers, media attention, and government favor. These organizational realities can detract from the effectiveness of the movement, particularly since <clears throat> the credibility of groups that base their appeal on the commitment to high moral principle can be easily compromised by public display, displays of narrow, self-interested behavior. Grassroots globalism also faces contradictions at the level of overarching objectives. The goal of creating a global civil society in which strong communities of identity transiting national borders become an everyday reality for most people remains a distant dream. Beyond a small but significant body of core activists and their close sympathizers, most people in most societies continue to privilege various local identities over globalists. This is why transnational movements are most effective when they can forge plausible connections between global issues and diverse sets of local problems that engage the active concerns of average people. Perhaps the most important overarching objective of grassroots globalists is, is to re-embed the global marketplace within a framework of democratic accountability. Yet the pursuit of this goal presents a paradox. States have historically served as the principal institutions for exercising democratic forms of governance. Yet in a global economy, capital has partially freed itself from the control of national authorities. The obvious solution is to create new forms of regulation at the global level. Yet this requires successful collective action among a group of almost 200 states, each of which will face incentives to attract renegade capital by cheating and defecting from any system of global regulation. Multilateral governance also faces resistance from the world's most powerful state, the U.S. government, which has recently embraced a unilateralist foreign policy that is openly hostile toward the construction of strong global institutions. Moreover, there presently exists no system for the direct representation of popular interests at the level of global institutions, which are, after all, creations of states and have to date proven more responsive to corporate elite interests than to popular pressure. Proposals to democratize global institutions like the IMF or the World Bank or the WTO by giving direct <coughs> representation to NGOs face the problem that, that such groups themselves are self-democratic. Most NGOs lack internal systems of democratic representation and have to hold leaders accountable to those on whom they have to claim to speak. How to overcome this democratic deficit in the creation of global institutions remains an unresolved puzzle. The alternative to global reg regulation is to reassert control over capital at the national level by reconstituting the power of individual states. While there surely exists considerable 
scope for action at the national level, this solution also presents problems. States acting alone run the risk of capital flight and retaliation from other states whose interests might be harmed by re-regulation. Widespread but uncoordinated movements to reassert national level controls could carry enormous costs by tearing apart the essential fabric of global commerce that has been created through the mechanisms of globalization. Most likely, re-embedding the global economy in systems of democratic accountability will require a multi-level approach. The vigorous engagement of civil society, monitoring corporate and state behavior, revitalize state controls at the national level where feasible, and architectural innovation at the global level to create a denser set of institutions that are more open, inclusive, and democratic in nature. In principle, grassroots globalism promises to reestablish a balance among contending social forces through globalization from below, while providing a multicultural alternative to nationalist, ethnic, and religious fundamentalism as responses to the pressures of globalization and modernization. Clearly, this is the most hopeful vision of the three reviewed today. But just as clearly, its realization will require a long and difficult journey. Running through all three visions is an attempt by various authors to come to grips with the complex and multifaceted consequences of globalization and modernization. Globalization is at heart tied up with the expansion of capitalism. In contemporary discourse, when we use the term capitalism, we tend to think about the market, which conjures up benign images of voluntary exchange of goods. But this formulation obscures, obscures the continuing class character of capitalism. Those who own and control the means of production uh, are given a privilege place in capitalist society. As a result, capitalist orders typically produce a concentration of economic and political power. But the hegemony of capital has never gone unchallenged. Popular movements have always sought to counter the power of capital largely through collective self-organization and the fight for democracy. After more than a century of struggle, the social democratic governments that emerged in North America and Western Europe after World War II served as relatively successful vehicles for taming the abuses of capitalism and creating a fair, creating fair and more balanced societies. Globalization has now freed capital from the social compacts that constrained its power during the post-war era. As a result, we are passing through a period of relatively untamed capitalist expansion. This too is not gone uncontested. Popular movements against globalization have taken two characteristic forms. Fundamentalist cultural movements seeking insularity and transnational social movements seeking more democratic control over capital, both the national and the global levels. One thing seems evident, a globalization project based upon the subordination of all competing human values to market imperatives is not sustainable. One alternative would be the continued growth of nationalist, ethnic, and religious fundamentalist forces, leading to a violent dismantling of the globalization project in ways reminiscent of the first half of the 20th century. The surest way to avoid this nightmare is to stop dreaming and to get on with the task of building a more just and more democratic global order based upon globalization of the law, from the law. We must, in other words, begin to think of ourselves as global citizens who are individually and collectively responsible for a shared future.